Hello, it's Hugh Turberville here, the editor of The Cricketer magazine. And in a minute, you're just going to see my interview with Dean Headley, uh, the former England fast bowler. We had a great chat. We talked about uh, his time at Worcestershire and then he went to Middlesex and he went to Kent. He's got an amazing story to tell, actually, about uh, Clive Lloyd, the legendary former West Indies captain. He drove Dean around the counties in his car looking for trials, looking for counties to play. Not only that, but also in the car was Carl Hooper, who went on to play a very uh, long career with the West Indies, and Phil De Freitas, who won 40 tests for England. So think of the talent in that car. That was amazing. That was sort of one of the good stories uh, to let to tell you. Just to say that the latest issue of the Cricketer magazine, the April edition, is on the shelves now, and that's got two pages on all the counties uh, ahead of the season. Um, we're one game into season now, but uh, which could take you right through the, the campaign. It's also got the famous fixtures wall chart. And to say with another round of games coming up this week, our reporters will be at the grounds. And for just £3.99 a month, you can subscribe to thecricketer.com and have full access to everything that we write at the matches. So without further ado, here is my interview with Dean Headley. Hey, Dean. How are you doing? Hello. Dean Headley here, uh, he, former England fast bowler, former Middlesex and Kent. You okay? Yep. Yep. A little bit of Worcester before I got sacked. <laughs> you did actually, didn't you? Yeah. I'll add that to my list. Forgot about that. Um, so it's Easter and uh, you're, you're at Blundell School now, aren't you? Yeah, it's been a busy term. Um, so I did 13 years at Stanford and then made the move to Blundell's last uh, last spring half term. So, yeah, last enjoying it. Dorset. Uh, or Devon. 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 I always get those two mixed up. Yeah. That's they cool. get very so sensitive you're... about Devon, Cornwall and Dorset. So, uh, especially jamming uh, strawberry on the scone. All right. Well, I'm from Suffolk, so I mean, that's like calling me from Norfolk, I suppose. So, yeah. No, I can understand that. So, um, so, so talking about counties, we'll start with that then. And, and I associate you with Middlesex, where I watched you at Lords bowling. I remember that quite vividly when I was at university uh, in London. And then Kent, obviously. Um, happy days, county cricket. You enjoyed those? Yeah, fantastic. I mean, um, obviously, my my start in county cricket wasn't wasn't great. Um, left school, John Worcester. Um, I was a young. I bowled a lot of overs as a kid. Lots of overs, but. I grew quite a lot between the age of 16 to 18. So I think it took a time for my body to catch up. So I was injured a lot at Worcester, but uh, they decided to release me. I spent a season with the help of Clive Lloyd. I went to um, a little club called Leasit in North Staffordshire, South Cheshire League. I proed for them. Um, I think after this is how small the club was. <clears throat> Big heart, big club in the sense of um, the amount of teams that they put out. But um, there was uh, eight. I worked out eight of the people were all related in the first team by some way, legally. But um, <laughs> <Speaking of> Norfolk. <laughs> yeah, so so it was, it was a great time. I took 80 wickets and 800 runs or whatever. And then Clive Lloyd took me around a few counties. And then Mike Gatton gave me an opportunity, which I'll be forever grateful for. At Middlesex and and luck well luckily or unluckily or fortunately um they <clears throat> my first game was actually playing in the first team because they had a load of injuries um so I went from playing club cricket to actually bowling in the op opening um game of the season which was MCC v the champions which Middlesex were well what well, fantastic to have Clive Lloyd as a mentor uh yeah yeah, not bad. I suppose that that is the advantage of um, being in the Headley family. But um, yeah. I've always been a close friend of my dad's, and um, they used to talk a lot of cricket. And then when I had these problems, um, Clive. I mean, first of all, he he wanted to see me actually play because yeah. he hadn't seen me for a while. Because obviously, it's his reputation taking me around, and um, and he actually drove me to all the trials. So uh, went to Somerset, went to Derby, went to Middlesex. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, he's um, 
we uh, we went up to Old Trafford for net. He picked me up from um, Hagley in in the West Midlands, just near Starbridge. And he said, oh, we, we just need to make a stop off. And um, a, a young gentleman called Carl Hooper stepped in the car. And then we went off to Old Trafford. And this was before I think Carl had made his presence felt on the international stage. And um, and then Phil DeFratis turned up and he was at the net. So it was uh, <laughs> quite, quite bizarre going from club cricket straight into um, practising with uh, two world superstars. Quite a talented car, that it was a serious number of test caps eventually <laughs> in that car, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah so you, just to, in case people don't know, your dad Ron Headley played for Worcestershire, yeah, and your grandfather, of course, was a legend, uh, West, West Indies, so amazing bat, batsman, and uh, the Black Bradman, wasn't he? He was called, wasn't he? So, um, it yeah, was, and the Mark Lathen called me the Beige Bradman. Right. <laughs> yep. Because he basically he, he basically thought the genes had faded. Oh, I see. Different times. Um, right. Well, where, when did he call you that then? When, at the start of your. Um, when I'm in in the test, uh, when I got into into the test side, so uh, I could right. hold a bat, but at, I, I guess a lot of people thought I was going to be a batter before the age of sixteen, and then really? I grew a lot. So uh, it all changed. Okay. Well, we're still on the subject of county, but we'll get to international. But um, Kent, you played at Kent. And I'm just thinking, guys, the last few days, as ever, people messaging me about um, county cricket and franchise cricket. The county cricket season is about to start. You know, and yeah. people like Michael Vaughan have said, replace them with franchises and Andrew Strauss wanted fewer counties, allegedly or possibly or or whatever. I mean, what do, you, what do you think about the franchise and county? Is it, are you a county loyalist? Um, I understand what the counties do. Um, my my argument isn't necessarily about um, about the number of counties. It's how much jurisdiction those counties have. So, effectively, we have I don't know. I think it's thirty nine or forty national counties including first class yeah um and i just think that to run the game of a first class game that only covers roughly about 30 percent of our area of land is very difficult because um what, what you know where do that where do um the minor counties fit um in relation to counties uh first class counties so if you take um a young man good player playing in Devon, obviously they've got a link with um, Somerset. But there's some strange links. I think Nor Norfolk is linked with Knotts, but actually it should be quite an open system. It shouldn't be those sorts of links. It should be more, we've got a good player. Every county should be able to look at them. Uh, if we're going to be true to try and get as much talent through, because otherwise you, you're, you're going to stockpile talent um, so if an area has got a gluttony of really good players, we need to find a way of sharing that talent out so that the, the best talent just gets out there. Forget about your allegiances or where you're, where you live. Um, we just need to go and find the best players. Mm -hmm. So with, with 18 counties, I, I, I do think if I, I always think if, if you started, if you started first class cricket again, what would you do? And I think that's where you start from. And for me, it would be defined areas. Um, I don't think um, children relate to counties anymore. Um, not all, all counties. So Lancashire is obviously strong. Yorkshire's got a strong um, case of, you know, I grew up in Yorkshire. You know, very proud of that. Um, but I'm not sure, so sure whether that relates to all the other counties. So in order to organise and have less jobs if you like which people won't like um australia western australia is one ceo who runs the whole of cricket in western australia and yet that is something like 24 times the size of england or something like that hmm. so i just think that our game can be slimmed down a little bit because then 
it's easier to channel everything through. Okay. When you look at South Africa and Australia, that's that's the thing is their states are very um, defined because of you've got a big city and then you've got a devoid of landmass between each area. So therefore, they're naturally divided. When we're, we're not naturally divided, but I, I think I think that in the future there will be regions. Um, they're like the old ITV regions, or Tyne Tees and Grenada and all that. Sort well, of whatever. I mean, look at look at the women's cricket. Um, their structure started from scratch. They've gone to regions. They've got counties underneath that that feed in. Um, in a way, that's probably. Um, a, a more aligned structure mm. and they do that because they wanted to channel all the talent into into a more condensed um system okay to get the well, best player. right well county fans will be upset then but um never mind we'll move well, on well i also think that the the the, the county second eleven needs strengthening because that's a massive gap between second team and and first team um mm. I think back in when I played, you always had the second overseas player. Uh, most team, most full second teams were full of pros. Actually, probably pros weren't even getting in the second team. Now it's sort of more looking at what the first team's doing. Squads are getting smaller, which means that effectively, um, I would say that second team is somewhere between what I used to play and academy. Okay. Or if you like to look at it, a super academy. Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. So your your uh, test career, um, I've got a friend actually, Morgan, who's re-watching all your old series at the moment. And it started with um, 1997. Yeah. Uh, Australia. And of course, that was a full storm when England won the first test at Edgebaston. But uh, I mean, you immediately did well, didn't you? Eight wickets, two wickets, six wickets in the, in the matches. 16 wickets and three tests. Yeah, uh, it was it was good. Um, I mean, it took me a long time to get into inter international cricket. Um, I don't think anybody really spoke about me till I got to about twenty four, um, and then I think I think I just grew into my body. And I was a bit unusual. I wasn't the typical English seamer, which uh, I used to nip the ball back a quite a bit off the seam to right handers, which meant it went away to left handers. I used to bowl pretty straight. So a lot of the percentage of my wickets were bowled LBW or court keeper, first slip, second slip. So my wicket taking was probably more aligned to test cricket. Um, when I bowled a good ball, it was a good ball to get get good players out. Um, whereas you'd see in county cricket, a lot of swing bowlers who would let get people caught at gully and in the driving, you know, in, in other areas, which you don't take wickets at test and match there. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I was seeing a video clip of Mr. Atherton praising you for the way you bowled to the left-handers, and then that winter you went to West Indies, and there were quite high hopes, weren't there, that England could finally beat the West Indies, but um, they didn't, and that was kind of Mike Atherton's last stand, wasn't it, as captain? Yeah, it was. I felt. I mean, we went to Jamaica, um, and the Test match was called off. So, if you were actually thinking. If the ECB were thinking that to give us the best chance, it wasn't to go and put a back-to-back -back test match on in Trinidad. Um, you just go, well, the shorter the contest, the more the more likelihood an upset. Um, so we went there and, I, I mean, I remember not bowling very well in the first test, um, but I bowled well in the second test. Um, yeah. And I was very much a rhythm bowler. You know, there's... Um, I didn't need to play a lot, but when I got into my flow, then I became, I think, quite a dangerous bowler. Um, uh, there's other bowlers been in history that they, they go on wicket-taking sort of spells, and, and I think I was one of those bowlers. Um, so on that, on that series, we played really well. We were unlucky at Barbados. I think we would have won in Barbados if it hadn't rained. Uh, which would have drawn the series. Um, and then we went to Antigua and, and Antigua, Antigua, we shouldn't have started. I mean, the, the wicket was wet. Um, we, we were, 
we were at the game within the first session because the wicket was wet. It then dried out and then it became the normal Antigua flat wicket and West Indies, I don't know, they've probably got about 500. Um, they got a lot of runs. Um, but yeah, I got 19 wickets in the series and 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 I think up to that point, only seven bowlers got 20 wickets in a West Indies away series. So I did all right for my first overseas tour. It's very well, did very well. Um, yeah, absolutely. But then, so the, the following summer, Alex Stewart was now the captain. And again, you started sort of developing this reputation as an overseas specialist and not necessarily playing every home test, didn't you? Yeah, quite bizarre that. So um, I can bowl on flat, flatter wickets and overseas wickets, but I can't bowl on English wickets. Um, I've always said, though, that you could probably pick 20 bowlers who could bowl for England, 20 seamers that could bowl for England in England. But I, I think you've probably only got about six or seven that could probably bowl overseas. So for me, possession is nine tenths of the law. I'd played all the test matches in the West Indies. I'd had a good series. But then I think Corky, I think Corky came in and, and they would argue that Corky came in and did really well. And that's fine. But for me, I think Corky had taken his first five wickets in two years in first class cricket. So I think we were more into the line of let's pick form all the time and let's look for that special player to come in to make a difference. But I think where England cricket's fortunes changed over the years, I think it was the introduction of central contracts, which meant people could be, you know, continuity of selection. Look at Zach Crawley now. Um, if you believe in a play, you've got to play them and you've got to keep playing them um, until that belief goes away. But bringing people in, it was a scourge of the 80s and 90s, bringing people in for one test match, two test matches, they get an average test match, they flip the coin, they pick the next one. And it was always a bowling attack that seemed to change, not the batting, um, which is fine. But actually, I think we did all right as bowlers. Um, I'm not saying the batters weren't weren't good, but I think the world bowling attacks were were pretty sharp in in those days. Um, if you, I don't think there's a weak bowling attack in the world. Mm. No, it's very good. I mean, you were competing with Goffey, Caddick, Cork, Malali, Malali Fraser. Yeah, so quite a good battery, very good battery of bowlers. Yeah, but Alex Stewart did then turn to you again that winter in Australia and, and that was kind of your finest hour wasn't it that amazing Melbourne test match yeah but I didn't play the first two test matches so um, it was always the last three I did all right I had um, you know my, my game was based on effort and yes I'd got some skills I could reverse swing a ball but I think I just bowled straight I had a natural variation which wasn't easy to pick up because I wasn't um I wasn't as technical bowler as a lot of people uh, try and be. Um, I really believed in natural variation. I had a natural, had a had a good ball that nipped back. Um, did I always know when it was going to nip back? Not always. Um, I swung the ball occasionally, so I think that that caused uh, indifference in the way people played me. Um, I know that Jeff Marsh at the end of the fifth Test match wanted to know why I didn't play the first two Tests. Um, and you know that's a nice compliment to have. Definitely, definitely, I'm an old swampy. <laughs> right. So then, unfortunately, then injuries struck, didn't they? Um, South Africa, ninety nine, two thousand. Duncan Fletcher liked the look of you, didn't he? But um, I'm afraid yeah. So, so I came, I came back off the Australia tour, and I honestly was my confidence level was high. There was a World Cup coming up in 99. Um, and what happened to you, I, I was bowling in the nets at Kent and I bowled for about I don't know, three weeks, whatever. And I was like, honestly, so excited about the, the coming season. And then I slipped on a black mat and didn't think anything of it. You know, things weren't so stringent in those days about reporting stuff. Slipped on a bat, black mat. Next day, T20 game against, um, just a warm-up game against Kent League. I didn't feel right. 
I didn't quite know where the ball was going. I, there was just something wrong. And this carried on throughout the season. Didn't play in the World Cup. Uh, I played two test matches that year that I honestly didn't know whether I was going to bore the ball down the leg side or the offside. Um, I'd just lost my control, which I'd never had in the whole of my life. Um, and it turned out that I had stress fractures, but they weren't giving me pain. But your body is really, um, your body's really clever at working out what's going on. So my body was basically packing in. Um, and then, as you know, I went to South Africa. I didn't do any training for six weeks. I bowled. It was back. I was bowling well. And I bowled for two days before I had a back spasm. And I never played a first-class game again. That's so sad, isn't it? What Do you think anybody could have done something about it in, in this modern era? Or 100%. Um, the issue was a little bit to do with insurance that... Um, they wouldn't insure my back after another 10 games of coming back. So mm. really I was, I was, I, I said to them, you're forcing me to retire. Um, and the money in cricket is about two years away before starting to explode. So I had a young family. I had to think about what I was going to be like grow, um, getting older. Um, and I didn't feel I could play without any insurance. Yeah, so as you say, the central contracts came in in 2000 and that was the start, wasn't it, of um, a different sort of landscape for, for cricketers, yeah. Well, yeah, I was uh, I was players' representative on that as well. So uh, while I was injured, I, I, um, I, I basically um, uh, told told NASA that the best way forward was, um, after, after doing some research, the best way forward was the PCA. Uh, players players union because if ever there's a dispute you needed your players union and a company called Harbottle and Lewis um, uh, who came in with another company but ended up representing the England team and do you know what team England player partnership is the same setup as it was that we set up years ago with Gerard Till and Bob Bob Mitchell um, and the PCA so actually probably one of my more defining things in cricket uh, isn't really known. Right. No, that's a, quite a legacy, isn't it? Definitely. So if you were in charge of re-sculpting England's attack this summer, um, yeah. what would you do? Uh, I think they've got many options. Um, the issue that they've got, their spinners might not bowl too much in county cricket because of the way that we put county cricket in uh, a very busy schedule, uh, top and tailed at the start and the end of the summer. Um, so that that's one of their challenges. Um, so where do they bowl the young spinner that they've just brought in? How will he get experience? I, I don't know. Um, and then you've got um, the bone attack. The big question is, what do you do with Anderson? I mean, I mean, 700 wickets is ridiculous. Um, he's a master at what he does, but at some point he won't be bowling for England at 60. I mean, maybe he will, but I don't think so. So I think it's how they manage that. He's a quality bowler, but who comes in? We've got a battery of young, fast bowlers. Pot's probably leading the way at the moment. Uh, strong, they're quick. I think it's in, in good shape. Good stuff. Uh, I understand that your your lad is uh, at Leicester Shoes. One to watch? Uh, he, he, he plays. He plays, yeah. 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 Good stuff. Well, I mean, we'll finish off. Um, so you're a, you're a, you're a schools coach now, yeah. but, and I know you've got some interesting views about club cricket as well and promotion and relegation. So you know, tying it all in with youngsters and, and development and stuff. You know, um, you don't believe in promotion and relegation, do you? No, I think I think when the ECB brought it in, I think it created a massive money market in county in um, club cricket. Um, it made people feel that their club was the most important thing. And, and look, club cricket for me is the most important thing in the whole of our system because that's where all the kids get introduced to cricket. If it's not there, cricket would die in this country. So when club cricket is strong, I think that we'll always be producing players all the way through. And it all starts with the introduction. So, you know, as Mike Atherton said, you can talk about 
going to private schools and everything like that, which are really good and nurturing the talent. Um, but a lot of players are cricketers before they get there. So very few are just absolutely created at schools. Um, but school private schools play a big part in that. Um, they harvest more talent than they used to than when I was at school. And I don't think that should be bemoaned, um, which it is a lot of the time. It, it's just a, a part of the system that really works well. Um, there's still probably 60% of um, state school cricketers who play first-class cricket. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me that the England team's full of private school uh, educated uh, players because um, if they're the best, that's what the private schools are going to try and get. Uh, it, it, it's not a stats thing. It's it's a, a sensible thing. If you've got the best players that, you know, private schools are going to invest and support. But and funny enough, they, they invest and support the cleverest kids with academic scholarships, the children who are really good at music and the children that are good at sport. Um, and that, that's what they look to do. Um, in terms of club cricket, I think if you look at, if you look at cricket as a world and the surface of the world, if a team goes up and a team goes down, where's the improvement? Because it's the same world and there's nothing fundamentally changed about anything apart from you've just destructurized the surface in many leagues. So every year, you know, the grounds change in the top division and the second division. But really, we should be playing our cricket on the best grounds. And each of the top clubs should have um, certain things that they have to hit, be able to be a top club a youth system good coaching, maybe a, a paid coach who's heads that club. The system should be more about producing players, introducing people to club to, to cricket and then producing players. So players need to move through a system quicker than a club can. So we'll have a system where I, I played in the Birmingham League, brilliant league. Um, it drew him from five counties. It didn't pay out a lot of money. It got young overseas players, you know, up and coming overseas players, and it was a tough league. Um, the next, you know, the second team cricket in that league was brilliant as well. Be, but there was no promotion relegation. It the promotion relegation happened in your club. So you, I started off in um, the third team at Old Hill, and then I made it into the second team, and then I made it into the first team. So you. When I say I'm not a fan of promotion relegation, there was promotion relegation in fixed leagues because you went through your club. Right. Uh, there wasn't so much movement in clubs. So what happens now is if a team gets relegated from the premiership, I think there was a team in Kent called Rax, and they'd been a premiership club for ages, and then uh, they got uh, relegated. Five players left out the first team. They got relegated again, and I think they went straight out the Kent League in six years and folded. Mm. That had nothing to do with the club. That was to do with players deciding to move. And why did they move? Because probably somebody offered them a little bit of back-end money, and, then, and that's how it works. Mm. So clubs get relegated or promoted, but generally it's quite money-orientated. So, that, you know, you'll have a good player who should play in the top league. He's playing three leagues below because somebody's putting turned a pound in his pocket. So, therefore, the best leagues are not the best leagues anymore because they don't have all the best talent playing in them. Right. And we've got to we've got to be strong. If I was a county and I was like Leicester, I would create my own league and I'd say, these are the 12 clubs. These are the 12 clubs. If you think you want to play for Leicester, you need to go to these clubs. And that's not denouncing other clubs, but in general, I've seen it before. You get a chairman, puts a load of money in, uh, invests in the club. As soon as that money stops, the club dies. You know, it, it's just false. It's, um, you know, emperor's new clothes, isn't it? It's 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 um, chasing full gold. Um, yeah. Nobody really cares, apart from the people that are at that particular club, yeah. about who won the league in whenever um 
it it's all uh, egos and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. and I I just see it as a simple thing that I just want the best cricketers to come through a system, and and for everybody to play at the right level. So the other side of it is it, it's anti youth. So when I was a kid and I was eleven, I could go and play men's cricket because my dad would be able to go right go and play in that league. You're definitely not going to come up against anybody bowls more than 60 miles an hour and you can play safely. Now you've got teams that can enter a league system, got a bit of money, and they've hired an 80 mile an hour um, West Indian or South African bowler who's bowling in League Six of whatever area. Yeah, no, I see. So therefore, I just think it's very anti-youth because if if it's only about the win and it's only about getting people getting promoted you're only in a league of 10 you're either in a relegation battle or promotion battle so when i did work at upchurch cricket club um i was playing 13 14 year olds and they were doing the job but one of the things i said if i if i play them they will play a role or at least have the opportunity to yeah. play a role. So mm. I'd, I'd bat a youngster who'd come in at number... Th- um, there's one lad, he'd never played second team cricket. I picked him out the thirds. He came in and batted. He batted number three. He got two fifties at a runner ball and they got a first baller uh, in three knocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and people said, well, why did you bat him at three? I said, well, if he bats at number three in his third team, he might as well come and bat for number three here because yeah. I'm going to dovetail it or... Do a bat him at number nine and he thinks, well, what's the point in playing cricket? So I just think that it's become too much about the win as opposed to development. And don't get no. me wrong, before people start attacking me saying, um, oh, so you're one of these uh, sports for fun. It's not. We all compete. We always compete. But there's bigger things to look at. And development and encouraging kids to play at 15 16 if you talk to them the reason why they don't play club cricket a lot of them will drop out going from youth cricket all the way through is because they don't get a bowl or a bat and how sad's that yeah absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely. this year old who's playing he's demanding to bat a number number one demanding to bowl his overs and you think, God, we only rent the game from the kids that were, we're only buying the game from the kids that are going to be playing in the future. So, yeah. Um, and and last, lastly, I know that I'm whittling on here. No, you're okay. It's very interesting. Lastly, leagues have lost their geographical boundaries. There's a reason why the Birmingham League is called the Birmingham League, because the people who played in it were based in the Birmingham or the Black Country. Um, now, or over time, Oswestry has got into the Birmingham League. Roehampton has got into the Birmingham League. And they're, they're nearly on the edge of Wales. Yeah, I was going to say. So geographical boundaries have been lost because anybody... Effectively, a team in Devon could get promoted to the Birmingham League because there's no restriction on it. If they want to travel, I see. they could do it, which is just ridiculous. So, so when you think about we're trying to make cricket sustainable by not having boundaries on where leagues operate, and if I know it doesn't sound a lot, but if you stretch a club that gets into the Birmingham League and it's thirty miles more than what it needs to be, that becomes a big issue for everyone. Yeah, not not just the first teams, the second team, the third team. So how can you be travelling an hour and a half, two hours to go and play a cricket game? Just bonkers. Money-wise, you know, um, why why would you do it? Yeah, no, it seems uh, it's a good point. I didn't know that, that they'd done that. I mean, you know, I played a bit in the Surrey League and, and it's huge. And, and, you know, you did have some quite epic trips right down to sort of uh, places like Normandy, you know, from South London. But um, but wouldn't that be that wouldn't that be traffic as well, though? Could be. I mean, at least that Surrey, you know, I, I didn't know that the, the Birmingham were taking teams from what Shropshire, Herefordshire, are they? Or... Yeah, because it's like um, 
it's like what they term as their pyramid system. So you've got the leagues. And, and I think they've just changed it recently to go back a little bit. But, right. you know, for me, it was player's choice. So we had players, we had people coming from Northampton to play in it, Derby. Wow. Um, but they came because they chose to come, not because they were forced to come. Yeah. Because um, in those days, if you got runs in the Birmingham League, you, you, you probably would be offered a contract. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and I think that's what that's the beauty of Australia. Uh, the ECB at the time thought they were, they were really following a um, an Australian system. I remember David Banks, who used to play for Worcester and Whiteshire. He um, he said he was at the meeting, and they kept banging on about Australia. And he said they don't run a system like that in Australia. They run everything's fixed leagues. Um, if you think you're any good, they take you to the league in the city. Um, and and they'll organise it. And all their clubs have got good coaches. They run training sessions. They're like semi-professional clubs. Mm. And, and that's what I think that England should go for. Um, I think we should go and look at how do we really look at how to get our best cricketers through. Mm. Well, very interesting, Dean. We'll have to re rewrite some of that for the Cricketer magazine. I think that was a, that was very good. Um, so thank you very much. 35 minutes of your time. I really appreciate it. No um, problem. Yeah, have, have a good uh, season with Blundells. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, hopefully speak to you soon. Brilliant. Thank you, Dean.